Chapter 38, Bowel Elimination. Today we'll be describing the physiology of bowel elimination, identifying variables that influence bowel elimination, assess bowel elimination using appropriate interview questions and physical assessment skills, assist with stool collection for lab analysis and direct and indirect visualization studies of the GI tract. Help develop nursing diagnoses that identify bowel elimination problems amenable to the nursing intervention. Identify appropriate nursing interventions to promote regular bowel habits. Identify appropriate nursing interventions when administering laxatives and antidiarrheals. Identify appropriate nursing interventions when administering enemas, rectal suppositories, rectal catheters, and when performing digital removal of stool. Identify appropriate nursing interventions to ease defecation. Plan and provide appropriate nursing care for a patient with an ostomy. Plan and implement. Evaluate nursing care related to select nursing diagnoses that improve bowel problems. So what are our expectations about um, bowel elimination? What should the usual pattern be and how easy is it to discuss this with people in the nursing field? All right, and our patients. So, um, you know, for some people, again, this is going to be a sensitive uh, topic. Although most people have experienced some sort of diarrhea or constipation, um, when they have severe or chronic alterations, then it can affect their fluid, electrolyte balance, their hydration, nutritional status, integrity of the skin, uh, their level of comfort and self-concept or how they perceive themselves, their level of self-esteem. Okay, so um, illnesses, diagnostic testing, medications, and sur surgical treatments can all affect the way that, that the bowel works or its ability to eliminate. So uh, we'll be discussing about those different things and uh, we'll be talking about different guides that you can use to help you assess the bowel elimination process and diagnostic studies uh, and your responsibilities associated with those studies and for treating these patients that have these uh, GI issues. So the GI tract itself, also referred to as the alimentary tract or canal, goes from the mouth to the anus, okay? And um, that is considered the outlet for the GI tract. So uh, we'll talk about um, different parts. Uh, we'll start with the large intestine. So the large intestine connects the uh, ileum to the small intestine. And the large intestine or the ileocecal or ileocecal valve. The valve helps prevent contents from entering the large intestine too soon and it prevents waste from going back into the small intestine. It is the primary organ for bowel elimination um, and it's in the lower or distal part of the GI tract. Uh, it also is referred to as the colon. And again, it, it's going to extend from the ileocecal valve to the anus. So for most adults, it's about five foot long, okay, uh, with variations in length. Uh, at its narrowest point, it's about one inch wide. And at its widest point, it could be as wide as three inches. The diameter uh, decreases as it goes from the cecum towards the anus. Now, from the first part of the large intestine, the digestive contents are going to enter the colon. Um, there's several segments there. Okay, we have the ascending colon, and that colon, and that goes from the cecum up towards the liver, uh, where it goes and crosses the abdomen. That turn is called the hepatic flexure. Once it turns, um, then it becomes the transverse colon crosses over the abdomen from right to left. Uh, it turns at the splenic flexure and then becomes the descending colon. The descending colon passes down through the left side of the body to the sigmoid or the pelvic colon. Now, the sigmoid is what has the feces, the solid waste products. Okay, so when someone has a sigmoidoscopy, okay, think about that. All right, um, 
it has the feces and the solid waste products that have reached the distal end of the colon and are ready for excretion. So once excreted, feces are called stool. All right, so it's going to, the sigmoid is going to empty into the rectum, and that's considered the last part of the large intestine. It's about five inches long, all right, about one inch wide, all right. And then um, in there, we have three uh, folds of tissue that will help move that fecal material into the rectum, will help hold that fecal material into the rectum temporarily, okay. Um, and then um, we have these vertical folds also present, okay, and um, each one of them is connected to an artery or a vein. So if those uh, veins become distended, then we call those hemorrhoids. Uh, the rectum is empty except immediately before and during defecation, okay. So the feces are excreted from the rectum through that anal canal and out that opening called the anus. What does this large intestine do? So it helps us absorb water. It forms the feces and it expels the feces from the body. Bacteria that are in there act on food residue uh, that helps it to um, move along to the large intestine. Um, this bacterial action actually produces vitamin K and some of the B complex vitamins that we use in the body. The other products of digestion, like chyme, are going to go from the small intestine to the ileocecal valve and into the cecum. About 1,500 mL of chyme will enter that large intestine daily, and uh, it will be either liquid or watery. So after it passes through the large intestine, most of that water is absorbed, about 800 to 1,000 of it, okay, by the intestinal tract. And this helps the track form that semi-solid consistency of normal stool. Uh, if the absorption does not occur properly, like if the waste products uh, go through the large intestine too fast, then the stool is going to be softer and more watery. If the stool remains in there too long, then too much water becomes absorbed and the stool becomes dry and hard. So uh, expulsion of the feces occurs through a process called peristalsis. So the autonomic nervous system is going to initiate that, all right, by sending these um, messages to the muscles of the colon. Now the parasympathetic nervous system will stimulate movement. The sympathetic nervous system will inhibit that movement. Contractions of the muscles called peristalsis happens about every three to 12 minutes and that moves those waste products along uh, through the intestine. Okay, after they get um, through the sigmoid colon, then the waste products enter the rectum where the, um, it, the movement is controlled by the anal sphincters. So the internal sphincter Okay, and the external sphincter, so the internal is where it's entering the rectum, and the external is located at the anus, and those are going to control the discharge of any feces or any gas or flatus, as it's referred to. Okay, the internal sphincter is made out of involuntary smooth muscle, and it's um, motivated by the autonomic nervous system through motor impulses. Uh, these motor impulses are carried by the sympathetic nervous system and they inhibit impulses, okay, um, by the parasympathetic nervous system. So together, these two systems work together um, to create an equilibrium there. The external sphincter has striated muscle, it's under voluntary control, and the levator anti-muscle uh, reinforces the action of the external sphincter, and it's also controlled voluntarily. So these two things are working together to expel these feces. Defecation actually refers to emptying of the large intestine. So um, when the parasympathetic stimulation occurs, the internal anal sphincter relaxes, the colon contracts, and that allows the feces to uh, enter the rectum. The rectum becomes distended by that mass, and that stimulates uh, the defecation reflex. So rectal 
uh, distension leads to an increase in intrarectal pressure, and that causes the muscle to stretch, and it stimulates the uh, defecation reflex and the urge to get rid of the uh, feces or the urge to poop. Um, again, that external sphincter is under voluntary control, so um, it's constricted or relaxed at will. So uh, during defecation, additional muscles will aid in the process um, and the voluntary contraction of the muscle at the abdominal wall by holding the breath and contracting the diaphragm um, helps increase that abdo abdominal pressure, okay, up to four or five times the normal pressure, which helps expel the feces. Uh, the muscles on the pelvic floor will then contract and help expo expel that fecal mass. Now, when the uh, patient uh, bears down to have that bowel movement, okay, uh, pressure is less. That can create a larger amount of blood return to the heart, causing the heart rate to slow down, and it can cause syncope even in some patients. It's um, termed that technique of bearing down is termed the Valsalva maneuver and it may be contraindicated in certain people who have cardiovascular problems or other illnesses. Um, defecation itself uh, it should happen at regular intervals. Uh, what is regular for one person may not necessarily be regular uh, for another. So some people may have a bowel movement every day. Uh, for other people it could be every two to three days. So it's what is their normal. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about the small intestine. So the small intestine is about 20 feet long, about one inch wide. Uh, it has three parts, the duodenum, the jejunum, and uh, the ileum. And the ileum is the distal section that connects with the large intestine. It secretes enzymes to help digest the proteins and the carbohydrates. These uh, digestive juices that come from the liver and the pancreas will enter the small intestines through an opening in the duodenum. Uh, the small intestine is responsible for digestion, food, and absorption of material of nutrients into the bloodstream. In there they have those uh, finger-like projections that is going to grab all the nutrients. Uh, peristalsis again is under the control of the nervous system. We talked about it, the autonomic nervous system, right? Contractions occur about every three to 12 minutes. Uh, mass peristalsis will sweep um, and occur every uh, one to four times each 24 hour period. Okay, so every, um, in about, um, in a 24 hour period, at least one to four times this peristalsis or this mass peristalsis is going to occur in the body if everything is working good. All right. And then uh, one third to one half of the food waste is excreted in the stool within the first 24 hours. So this is just showing you an example of that uh, peristaltic movement and what is happening. So peristalsis itself is that involuntary progressive uh, wave-like movement of the muscular skeletal part of the GI tract. So this muscular part of the GI tract is stimulating these waves, okay? It's been stimulated from um, the autonomic nervous system. So we have this wave-like movement happening and it's moving things or causing things to move along the tract. Uh, things that can influence the person's ability to eliminate. So things that can affect um, the person's uh, elimination factors are uh, illness, okay, developmental stages, daily patterns, uh, the amount of food or fluid intake and the quality of it, the level of activity, uh, lifestyles, emotional states, any sort of pathological process or illness, medications, uh, different procedures, uh, especially diagnostic tests or surgery. So uh, for developmental considerations, um, what a person eats and their ability to digest nutrients and eliminate those wastes uh, greatly affects. Okay, so an infant's stools are going to be different from those of an adult because, um, you know, they're eating different foods. A baby's eating formula um, and their system is still developing. Okay, so um, patients are often reluctant to discuss bowel habits and problems, okay, or the way their stools look. 
So we have to be familiar with certain um, bow concerns uh, that are pertinent to each developmental group because we have to know what to look for and what kind of questions to ask to eliminate the answers that we need uh, in order to determine what's going on with the patient. So, um, so we see these uh, different um, variables and we're gonna talk about them a little bit more in depth. So uh, for the infant, okay, it depends on whether they're getting breast milk or formula. Uh, the stool is going to look um, one way for one and one way for another. So for breast milk, um, the babies are able to easily break down and absorb the nutrients. All right, so these babies are going to have more frequent stools, and they're going to be yellow uh, to a golden yellow and loose, and they generally don't have much in the way of odor. Uh, for formula babies, uh, the stools will be more of a yellowish to brown, and they'll be paste-like consistency, and they're generally going to have a stronger odor uh, because of the proteins that are in the formula. All right, but um, both of them may have curds and mucus, and uh, baby has no voluntary control over the uh, bowel elimination process. The number of stools uh, can vary. All right, so if the patient's breastfed, they might have two to 10 stools a day, but if they're bottle fed, they might only have one to two. Uh, generally, by the time they're one, they're passing at least one to two stools a day. Uh, sometimes parents can mistakenly interpret the liquid stool as diarrhea, all right, because we are concerned when a baby has more than three loose stools in a day. Uh, this can be related to overfeeding, um, it's an increase in frequency and a change in the consistency of the stool. So if it is real diarrhea, it does require evaluation. Remember that infants are at much higher risk um, for things like dehydration and uh, fluid volume deficit. So we have to give that uh, some consideration. Okay. Um, the toddler. Okay. Um, well, before we move on to the toddler, let me just say that um, as long as the stools are soft and uh, the child is not constipated, you'll know if it's constipated because they're going to be dry, hard, um, hard for the baby to pass. It may draw its knees up or have some discomfort, okay? So um, you don't want to give suppositories or laxatives without consulting with the physician. All right, and then now toddlers, okay? So for toddlers, um, and this goes between usually the ages of 18 and 24 months. Okay, so at this point, their external uh, sphincters have become fully developed. So they have voluntary control over the defecation. Uh, it does require intact muscular, sensory, and nerve structures. Um, successful bowel training also includes awareness by the toddler, the need to defecate, and the ability to be able to communicate that need. All right. Also, the toddler's um, success will be based on, you know, the, the ability to please uh, the person that's involved, praise, reinforcement, and uh, successful behavior. Daytime control is going to be attained by about 30 months, but the age can vary uh, for each child. So this is day, daytime control of the bowel movement. All right. Parents need to understand that these patients have to be physiologically mature. Okay, um, that's the first priority in order for them to be successful in bowel training. We don't punish the child or shame them if they're not ready to be uh, toilet trained, or we don't punish them if they have accidents. Toddlers that are to toilet trained uh, can sometimes regress uh, and soil themselves if they're hospitalized, if they're scolded, or if um, some sort of disgust is shown towards their uh, behavior. Also, um, you know, when a new baby comes into the house or a new child or some different circumstance changes. So try to determine the cause if um, the child is regressing. All right, uh, school age children, adolescents, and adults. So um, from childhood to adult, the pattern can vary in quantity, frequency, and uh, rhythmicity. So people worry about uh, their stool characteristics or bowel habits um, endlessly. Others may not care at all. All right, so we have to um, emphasize that.
they shouldn't use over-the-counter laxatives or enemas because they can cause uh, problems, all right? One, the bowel can come become dependent upon it, and we want our bowel to stay um, in that voluntary mode, okay? Um, irritable bowel syndrome also happens quite frequently in the adult population, and that can cause constipation, diarrhea, or both. And this can be brought on through diet, stress, uh, depression, and anxiety. And then in the uh, older adult, okay, constipation is usually a problem for these patients. Uh, the rectal receptors have a decreased response to the stretching. Uh, that can lead to a decreased urge to move the bowel and result with a large amount of stool in the rectum. Uh, diarrhea, frequent fecal impaction, okay, or fecal incontinence can be caused by physiological or lifestyle changes. So uh, you want to look at the box on page 1422 in your book, okay, um, about different practices with the older adult. Which food is recommended for an older adult who is constipated? So A, cheese, B, fruit, C, cabbage, or D, eggs. So if you said fruit, you'd be right. Fruits and vegetables have a laxative effect on the system. Cheese and eggs have a constipating effect. And cabbage, although a vegetable, will produce gas. So the type of food we eat and the amount of food we eat can affect elimination. Uh, we really need a high fiber diet, about 25 to 30 grams of fiber, um, along with a daily fluid intake of 2,000 to 3,000 mLs. So high fiber foods are going to be things like whole grains, bran, dried peas, beans, uh, fresh fruits, vegetables, things that will increase the bulk in that fecal matter. All right, and that's going to um, cause more regular um, uh, peristalsis, and it helps to eliminate and put us on um, a much uh, nicer cycle. Okay, so um, foods that can constipate are, are going to be things like uh, cheese, lean meats, eggs, pasta, and then foods that have more of that laxative effect are going to be fruits and vegetables, bran, chocolate, alcohol, and coffee, and then foods that just produce gas are going to be cabbage, onions, beans, and cauliflower. So our digestive systems work differently. It can vary by culture. Um, if we're traveling to a different country and we're eating native foods or drinking the water, it can cause us issues with uh, both digestion and elimination. All right, so a lot of times we'll see diarrhea or changes in that uh, bowel elimination pattern um, when we're eating different foods or when we're eating out a lot. Um, also, people who have problems uh, with like uh, lactase, okay, that can um, give them a problem with digestion if they're eating milk or dairy products. Okay, so um, other things that produce excessive gas if they have something like Crohn's or um, irritable bowel movement. Um, also things that stimulate the bowels like caffeine and chocolate if they have those kind of issues. Uh, or they could have something called uh, dumping syndrome, okay? And with that, um, we would have to decrease the amount of fluids that they take in with mills and maybe decrease um, some of the things that they do after the mill to uh, destimulate the peristalsis factor because in that particular case, peristalsis is increased. Uh, what kind of effects can medications have on stools? So things like uh, aspirin or anticoagulants can cause pink or red uh, tones in the stool. And usually that's an indication of uh, the potential indica indication for bleeding, right? So we would want to be con a little bit concerned about that. Okay, iron. Uh, iron can cause us to have black stools. Um, bismuth siciliate, okay, this is Pepto-Bismol. And we use it to treat diarrhea. Um, remember that it has some of the same qualities as aspirin. It can also cause black stools. Uh, antacids can cause a white discoloration or some speckling in the stools. And antibiotics can sometimes cause these stools to have a green or grayish color. Um, also, medications can help promote peristalsis, so a laxative. All right, and then we have um, things like Pepto-Bismol, okay, or um, Imodium, 
which um, are antidiarrheal medications, so they inhibit peristalsis. All right, other uh, medications um, that can affect our opioids, right? Those can cause constipation, okay? And um, antacids, things that have aluminum, iron sulfate, or anticholinergic properties can decrease uh, the motility of the uh, gastrointestinal area, okay? So that can slow down peristalsis and also cause us to become constipated. Physical assessment of the abdomen. So how are we going to evaluate that patient physically? So remember uh, when we're doing our assessment here, we change up a little bit. And part of the reason is because we don't want to um, interrupt the natural um, rhythm of uh, the uh, bowel sounds, okay? So we want to hear what they sound like naturally before we disturb that process. So for abdominal assessment, we're going to do the inspection, then the auscultation, uh, then the percussion, okay? Um, so we're um, inspecting, we're looking at the contour, uh, we're looking for masses, scars, distensions, and how are we going to describe that contour? You know, is it six six pack? Is it, you know, uh, large and soft? Um, is it large and distended? So how are we going to uh, describe how it looks to us? Um, and is there anything outside physically that you can see? Uh, were you able to see any masses obtruding, any scars or anything without even filling? Can you just look and see that? Okay, so those are the kind of things that you're looking at. Now, um, peristalsis wouldn't be usually... Um, observable in a patient if they were super thin you might be able to see it okay um, you're just looking right now for anything that might be protruding distending uh, or look you know abnormal and then you're going to auscultate so you're going to use that diaphragm hopefully warmed up uh, you're listening for bowel sounds you want to use a systematic uh, clock approach if the person has an NG tube in place you would want to disconnect it from the suctioning so that you could actually hear the different sounds Okay, uh, keep in mind that um, timing, okay, of the patient's most recent meal or bladder can also affect the exam. So you might want to actually have them empty their bladder before you start this, all right, because it's going to take you a few minutes and typically um, you want them lying down so that you can really uh, get a good listen to all the sounds that are in there. And um, also you'll be able to percuss and all that stuff appropriately. All right, so... Um, you're, when you're talking to them, um, things that you want to um, ask them about is, you know, their normal patterns and stuff like that. And then when you're listening, what are you listening for? So you're listening for uh, frequency and character of the uh, bowel sounds. You're listening for these little audible clicks, okay? Um, there should be about 5 to 30 of these little clicks per minute. Um, you're listening for gurgles, Okay. Uh, the sound of air and flattest moving in that GI tract, and they're usually going to be kind of a high-pitched, uh, gurgling, soft sound. So you would want to um, note if there was uh, hypoactive bowel sounds, uh, the rate is not very fast. Um, you would want to note like what quadrant, where are they located at specifically, okay, because you want to be listening in all four quadrants. Um, how intense is the sound? Uh, how often? Um, hypoactive bowel sounds, okay, usually that's something you might see like after surgery or if someone has um, a bowel obstruction. But this is going to be a later sign of that bowel obstruction. Hyperactive bowel sounds usually uh indicate increased bowel motility. So you might see these in patients who have like diarrhea, uh, gastroenteritis, or you might even see them in the early part of a bowel obstruction. And then decreased or absent uh, bowel sounds. And that's usually only after you listen for at least two minutes or longer. All right. And you don't have any bowel sound. It's absent. Again, you would want to document where and um, exactly what quarter and all that stuff. Um, and this is commonly associated with things like peritonitis, paralytic ileus, or prolonged mobility. 
Also, you're going to describe those sound, bowel sounds. So are they audible? Are they hyperactive? Are they hypoactive? Or are they inaudible? Uh, percussion and palpation. Okay, you're going to do light palpation in each quadrant. You want to make sure that your hands are warm. Uh, you can bend the patient's knees to make it a little bit easier. And you're watching their face for any uh, signs of pain during the palpation. Okay, so make sure you do the quadrants in a systematic manner. And you're watching for those nonverbal signs. Okay, resistance, tenderness. Uh, also, you're feeling to see if you feel any enlargement of the organ or any mass. Does the patient complain? Okay, and then you're going to pal palpate the area of pain last. If the uh, abdomen is distended, uh, then you want to notice, you know, is it firm? Is it taut? How does it feel? So as you do uh, perineal care, on the patient, you want to do uh, an examination on the outside, just a superficial examination, and you're looking, you know, to see if it requires any further exam. Uh, you're looking for things like breakdown, um, you know, how does it look, lesions, ulcers, fissures, uh, any bleeding, any hemorrhoids, anything like that. All right, you're also looking for um, any fecal mass that might be in the anus, and uh, you're looking around the area of the skins for irritation or breakdown, and that could be associated with diarrhea or incontinence. All right, usually if there is some sort of fecal mass um, there, uh, it will distend the anus a little bit. You're also responsible for observing and recording information about the patient's stool. So you're looking, what does that stool look like? What's the color of it? What's the size of it? What's the consistency of it? Okay, you're reporting anything unusual, including if they have gas or no gas. Now, when someone has surgery or something like that, it's that return of that gas or return of that flatus that tells us that peristalsis is in the process of returning. Okay. Um, how are you going to go about uh, collecting that stool? What kind of um, things do you need to do as the nurse to make sure that you don't contaminate yourself, the patient, or the stool sample? Okay, and remember, again, uh, this could be a little bit embarrassing uh, for, the, for the patient um, when you're trying to collect it. Okay, so um, things that you want to think about is, um, is your patient at risk for this bowel elimination problem? Is this something I need to be monitoring them for? Okay. Um, and um, what kind of things um, would I also be looking at? So uh, does the patient have any lightheadedness or any um, uh, unusualness when they're straining? Um, are they able to ambulate um, to the bathroom? Are they able to accurately um, tell you about problems? Do they have control over their bowel movements? You know, are they continent, incontinent? Uh, do they have any warning signs and do they know what the warning signs are for colon cancer? Okay, so these are all things that you definitely want to talk to your uh, patient about and make sure that they're aware of it. All right, so stool, when you're looking at it, um, you're looking at the volume, okay, and that is variable. Uh, if we have diarrhea, okay, sometimes we can have a large amount coming out, all right, and a frequency of it. So you're looking at that in the infant. Okay, what color is the stool? So it's going to be yellow to brown, and then uh, in children, it becomes brown. Remember, stool can vary in the color uh, but with the infant, depending on whether or not they're taking milk products um, or whether they're taking formula, and the same thing with the odor. All right, now the odor um, should be a little bit pungent, and that can be affected by the foods ingested. Again, a baby that's on breast formula is may or may not have a little bit of an odor, and it may be more likely in children that are taking a formula. Also, if somebody has something like C. diff, that can significantly change the odor. Okay, it's one of those odors that once you smell it, they call it a barnyard smell. It doesn't, you know, there's no other odor that smells like it. Uh, what's the consistency of it? And again, you know, if it's coming out of the anus, it's going to be one consistency, right? Um, 
not necessarily, but I mean, normally you would expect it to be kind of uh, solid and formed, um, but soft. Okay, I mean, it can come out of the anus in the form of diarrhea or constipation. Now, the other thing, what I was getting to is if the patient has some sort of um, ostomy, okay, like a colostomy, a sigmoid ostomy, or ileostomy, then you have to know like what part of the colon does that affect. So how would the stool normally come out of that section? Okay, so is it expected to come out more formed? Um, so depending on what section of the bowel was resected there, on how that form stool is going to come out, okay? Because certain sections, it's going to come out more liquid than others if it was um, resected higher in the colon. So it's something that you want to be aware of and just look at. I'm not going to go into it because it's a lot of extra detail, um, but you definitely are going to want to know that as uh, you get more in tune with med search. All right, and then um, what kind of shape would it have? Okay, does that make a difference? Yes, because in patients that have things like Hirschsprung's disease, they're going to have more of a ribbon-shaped uh, type of stool. Okay, so if someone has a problem uh, with their uh, intestines, they could have a different shape of a stool. It might not be formed the way as the same as others. And are there any constitution constitutes in it? So that's things that we wouldn't normally see, like blood. Uh, excessive fat. So like our patients with um, cystic fibrosis, they might have extra fat in their stools. So um, that's something that's going to tell us, you know, that this patient has this disease process or that something's going on. Uh, warning signs of colon cancer. Do they know those? Okay. What are those things? Uh, rectal bleeding, changes in the bowel elimination pattern, blood in the stool, cramping in the uh, lower abdomen. So these are things that you should know um, when you're doing these uh, stool sample collections. Okay, so when you're collecting the stool, you're going to get the specimen according to your facility's procedure. Make sure you label it appropriately and make sure you take it to the lab. And then based on what kind of sample you got, you make sure that um, the container is put into a temperature a properly temperature controlled environment. Sometimes we refrigerate stools, sometimes we have to uh, freeze them. So it just really depends on what you're getting the specimen for, um, what's the time that it's gonna be in the refrigerator and things along that uh, nature. You wanna use um, medical aseptic techniques when you're collecting it, okay? Uh, this way you don't um, contaminate yourself and you don't contaminate the stool. Uh, hand hygiene before and after glove use, okay, and you're going to wear disposable gloves anytime you're collecting a stool sample, okay. You don't want to contaminate the outside of the container, okay, with the stool, all right. Be careful. Other people have to handle it, and be careful when you're packaging it, label, labeling it, and transmitting it so that it does, I mean, uh, transporting it so that it doesn't leak, okay. Um, also, um, you have to teach your patient how to collect a stool sample and what to do with it if they're collecting it in the home environment. A lot of patients might not understand and they might be embarrassed to ask questions. So you want to make sure that you explain everything to them uh, appropriately so that they understand. All right, some instructions that you might want to give them. Uh, go to the bathroom first as far as voiding, okay, because you don't want to contaminate the stool with urine. All right, that could affect the lab studies. Uh, make sure they go into the proper container. It has to be either a clean container or a sterile bed pan, uh, depending on the specimen that's required. Okay, um, you don't want them to go into the toilet because that's going to affect the analysis results. Um, also, you don't want them putting tissue in the container. Um, you don't want them using soap or detergents uh, that could affect the results. And you want to make sure um, that they let the nurse know when the specimen is available so that it can be placed into the proper temperature controlled environment so that it doesn't spoil. All right. Also, um, if you're putting the specimen into a lab container, you can put gloves on and you can use the tongue blades all right, to lift it and transport it into the container. Also, um, if some of the stool includes things like blood, mucus, or pus, you want to make sure that that portion is included in the specimen. You should also make sure that if the patient had any barium or any barium enemas, uh, that that is not included in the solution or in the um, 
stool sample. Okay, and um, also you want a specimen that's fresh. If uh, you can't get it to the lab right away, then you're going to have to uh, refrigerate it. Okay, and that should be in a refrigerator that's approved for specimens. So if you have a refrigerator with your patient's snacks in it, uh, you're not going to throw your stool sample in there. Okay. Sometimes we have to culture the stool. All right. Um, if we think that there's infection, virus, bacteria, fungi, parasites, so uh, you want to get that before we start any antibiotics, and um, make sure that um, you know the lab is aware. Okay, and if we have any certain medications that we're on that might interfere, um, we also would want to make sure that the lab is aware of that. So again, you know, patients should avoid first to avoid contaminating the, the sample with urine, defecate in a container, not a toilet bowl, um, no toilet tissue in the bedpan. Uh, avoid contact with soaps or detergents, and then notify the nurse when the specimen is available. Uh, is the following statement true or false? When collecting stool using the technique timed specimen, the nurse should consider the first stool passed by the patient as the start of the collection period. And that's true. Whenever we're collecting a, a stool using a technique for a time specimen, the nurse should consider the first stool passed by the patient as the start of the collection period. So for this uh, time specimen, that's on page 1429 in your book. All right, the first stool passed by the patient starts that collection process. Um, it may require saving the entire stool passed or only a sample. We collect the required volume of stool passed within the designated period, and then we follow the specimen for sending those uh, stools to the lab. So um, when we're looking at the uh, colon, we're using uh, direct visual visualization studies uh, such as endoscopy uh, this looks at the organs or the cavities and it's done using an endoscope a long tube with fibers that transmit light into the organ and it returns an image that people can view all right so uh, these pincers are inserted through a tube uh, they go down through the throat okay and uh, it lets the um, doctor view the uh, mucosa the blood vessels and organs that are helpful in diagnosing uh, inflammatory ulcerative and infectious diseases. So it also looks at benign and malignant uh, neoplasms and other lesions in the esophageal, gastric, or intestinal mucosa. Um, so it's called an EGD or an esophagastroduodenoscopy, and this is going to look at the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum. Uh, also, we have the colonoscopy that looks at the large intestines from the anus to the ileoco, ileocecal valve, I'm sorry, and the uh, sigmoidoscopy, and that looks at the sigmoid colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. Then they have the wireless capsule endoscopy. All right, this is a capsule that you actually swallow, and um, it allows a visual examination of uh, the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum. And then eventually, you know, it's disposable, so you'll get rid of it through your stool. So which of the following direct visualization tests use a long flexible fiber optic lighted scope to visualize the rectum, the colon, and the small distal bowel. And that is your colonoscopy. Okay, this uses a um, lighted scope, okay, to visualize the rectum, the colon, and the bowel. The esopho go Gastroduodenoscopy examines the esophagus, the stomach, and the upper duodenum. 
the sigmoid oscopy looks at the distal sigmoid colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. And then the upper GI series uses uh, fluoroscopy. Flor fluoroscopic, I'm sorry, fluoroscopic examination. So you're going to take that barium swallow, all right, and that lines everything there, or they might give you a barium enema, um, depending on which area they're looking at, if it's a lower GI, okay, and um, they look at uh, different parts um, with the uh, x ray. Okay, so some other ways we're going to look at these bowels are through indirect visualization of the GI tract, and this is done through radiography. So we have these x-rays, uh, these GI series that we're going to perform, and they can look for things like obstructions, inflammatory disease, tumors, ulcers, lesions, uh, hernias, any other kind of structural change in the GI tract. It uses some sort of contrast normally, normally like a barium enema or a barium drink. Okay, so depending on which, um, whether we're looking at the upper or the lower, uh, when we take these barium enemas we, or um, drinks, we have to encourage a lot of fluids with the patient afterwards because we need to flush the barium out and it can cause constipation in the patient. Uh, fluoroscopy is another um, way of looking um, and that's when it lights up um, the areas of that um, <clears throat> Uh, GI tract that are um, highlighted because of that barium uh, drink or enema that they took. All right. Um, MRIs can also help uh, provide different views of things. So we can use those. Um, the um, small bowel series, the barium enema, which we already talked about, abdominal ultrasounds, and uh, CT scans also. All right. And CT scans can be done. Um, with or without contrast. So when we're scheduling our patients for diagnostic studies, uh, we want to make sure that we're following, following certain guidelines. Okay, so um, if they have more than one test, um, we want to do the fecal occult blood test to detect um, GI bleeding. The barium study, that's going to help us uh, visualize the GI structure, and um, it also helps us see any inflammation, ulcer, tumor, stricture, or other lesions. So uh, we would want to do this um, before we do an upper GI study. Um, endoscopies, okay, those are going to help us look at abnormalities, uh, sources of bleeding, and if possible, we might have to get um, tissue samples. So that would um, go after we do the non-invasive procedures. So we would do non-invasive first, and then if that didn't work, then we might look at other invasive procedures. The barium enema um, and routine radiography, these should be done before the upper GI series because that barium that is retained from the upper GI could take several days to pass through the GI tract, and it could cause um, issues with being able to see things on the study. Non-invasive procedures, um, the reason why we do these first is obviously because they're non-invasive, all right? So we always want to do non-invasive stuff with our patients before we do uh, invasive. And then um, we have to think about what comorbidities does the patient have when we're scheduling things. So do they have any issues with uh, diabetes? Why is that an issue? Well, they could um, require that they be MPO. Um, they may need an altered diet. Also, if we're using some kind of contrast, like in the CT scan, all right, and they're taking something like metformin, uh, we may have to stop that a couple days beforehand because that could cause uh, kidney issues or problems uh, with the procedure. So um, if bowel elimination is our patient's problem, um, we have to look for things um, that we can prevent or resolve uh, by using independent nursing interventions if possible. So um, maybe uh, new self-care behaviors, okay, because maybe they don't know about something that they need to know about. 
Um, maybe they don't know about uh, they need to drink enough fluids or um, maybe they have some other issue or maybe it's associated with some kind of medication that they're taking and they're not aware that the medication is causing them a problem with the constipation. Uh, what would you want them to have? You would want them to have a soft for formed bowel movement every one to three days without pain or discomfort. Um, you would want them to understand that diet and exercise and increase in fluids can help uh, eliminate the bowel and make it function better. Uh, you know, that high fiber diet and then um, exercise. Okay. And also if there's a specific change in the stool, the color or consistency um, before they start using over the counter uh, laxatives and remedies, they should probably seek the advice of their uh, physician. Uh, how do we promote regular bowel habits? So we use things like um, timing, encouraging the patient to go at the usual time of the day and not to avoid going when they have to go because sometimes um, if they avoid it, um, it can cause them to become constipated. Um, maybe they need assistance to the bathroom, so they would want to call early, you know, and try to get that assistance as soon as they start to feel the urge. That can happen a lot of times like um, an hour or so after a meal because, you know, the um, peristalsis starts to occur. And so the food that we have in our stomach, the body's ready to get rid of it. All right. Uh, sometimes patients feel uncomfortable about requesting time to eliminate. So you want to make sure that, you know, patients understand that you understand this is a natural process and they shouldn't postpone it. All right. Uh, positioning, the patient needs to be in a proper position to defecate, okay? If you're not comfortable, the toilet height isn't right, um, or if there's other people around and you're worried about offensive odors and stuff like that, it can interfere, all right? So your patient should be comfortably sitting. Um, if they need an elevated toilet seat, then they should have one. Uh, not having one could be a safety issue, okay? And sitting up promotes that uh, normalcy. And um, the way that we would want to be uh, when we're normally going to the bathroom. So that's also going to help promote a regular bowel movement. Um, the bedpan, if we have to use it, we use it. But, you know, if we can avoid it, we try to avoid it and maybe even use a bedside commode if possible. Okay, sometimes when patients have to use bedpans, remember they're cold, they're hard to sit on. Uh, we can't always get in a comfortable position. So we might not want to use that bedpan. All right. Um, so if we can't have the um, head of the bed elevated to at least 30 degrees, then we might not want to use that uh, bedpan unless it's contraindicated to put the uh, head of the bed that way or the doctor ordered something specifically. Also, if someone's weak, they might need something like an overhead uh, trapeze to help them get off and on the bedpan. Privacy is a huge issue, especially if you're using a bedside commode. OK, um, remember that people are in the room with other people. Sometimes they have foul odors and they're embarrassed of those odors. And also you make sounds when you defecate. Some people don't even, you know, they'll wait until they're the only one in the bathroom. If they're using a public bathroom and they have to poo, they're going to wait until, you know, nobody else is in there because they don't want other people to either smell it or hear it. OK, so they're embarrassed by that. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that we're using privacy uh, screens or curtains. Um, or shutting the door, you know, if we can, and offering our patient as much privacy as we can. Also, uh, nutrition. How are we going to approach nutrition with these patients? So we want to make sure um, that they know that they have to take in adequate fluids, adequate fiber, um, eat those foods um, that contain, you know, things that promote bowel function. Okay, two to three thousand mLs a day, high fiber intake. Remember, we said about twenty-five grams. Uh, water is the choice of fluids because there's no caffeine, no sugar. Um, those things can cause different changes in the bowel uh, movement. Okay, um, we just have to be careful uh, with patients that have contraindications to um, increases in fluid, like someone who's in heart failure or someone that has a kidney problem. Otherwise, in that, we generally don't restrict fluids. Okay, um, increasing that fiber intake without giving the proper fluids can cause additional problems. So we want to make sure if we're doing one that we're following the other. All right, exercise. Okay, uh, there's a little bit of conflicting evidence, okay, regarding exercise and how it affects constipation. We know that regular exercise can improve GI motility and aid in defecation, uh, but um, sometimes excessive um, 
exercise can interfere. So we want our patient to do about um, two and a half hours a week, okay? Getting out of bed, walking, okay? And um, trying to do those um, exercises that help with those weak abdominal and perineal muscles. So some things they can do um, is abdominal uh, setting where they lie in a supine position and they tighten and hold the abdominal muscles for six seconds or thigh strengthening where the thigh muscles are flexed and contracted, bringing the knees close to the chest and then lowering them to the bed. So we want to uh, prevent constipation in our patients. That's that dry, hard stool that's hard to pass, okay, and it's caused by a decrease in uh, motility in the patient. Also, it can be caused by um, either an increase in the fluid absorption from the fecal area or not taking in enough fluids, okay? Those are some of the common reasons. Uh, also, patients don't have enough bulk or fiber in their diet. Uh, patients that are going to be at risk are those that are at bed rest that take things like opioids or other medications that cause constipation. Uh, people who have um, low or um, decreased bulk in their fiber or restrictive fluids. Um, people that are depressed and people that have a central nervous system disease or those that might have some sort of uh, local lesion around the um, anal area or the tract that uh, causes pain when they defecate. So uh, for diarrhea, diarrhea in adults um, is three or more loose stools in a day. Uh, we need to know what that consistency of the stool is, okay? Um, but patients um, with diarrhea usually pass the stools more frequently. It's also associated with intestinal cramps, nausea and vomeria. <laughs> nausea and vomiting can occur, and blood also can be in the stool. Uh, that's a protective response for the body. Um, when something's irritating that intestinal GI tract. So um, it, sometimes it can come out in large amounts and it can cause us to, to lose those electrolytes extremely fast. Okay, so we have to be careful in uh, infants, young children, and older adults. Uh, if it goes untreated and we lose too much fluid or electrolytes, then it could put the person at a high risk for a life-threatening complication. All right, so um, if oral intake is possible, Things that we would want them to do is avoid cold fluids, avoid uh, fluids that are high in sugar or rich foods. Um, they should um, stay away from sweets and then eat bland foods in small portions. Uh, other things that we would want to um, do is make sure that they have a call, a call uh, bell um, close or a bedpan or a commode that's easily in reach because it's embarrassing and um, sometimes when it, you're ready to go, you're ready to go, you can't wait, okay? Um, and we wouldn't want the patient to uh, try to risk getting out of bed, especially if they were dizzy or they had some other issue, they might fall, okay? So um, whenever possible, we try to get rid of the cause of the diarrhea. Um, we can discontinue medications if they're call, causing it and, um, Hopefully, the diarrhea will return back to normal within one to three days. Sometimes uh, patients can have seepage or leakage, or leakage of that liquid stool, um, and that could be associated with a fecal impaction. So we might want to evaluate them for that uh, before we start with the anti-diarrheal medications. And then special care uh, to keep the area around the anus um, free from irritation. Okay, so we might have to use some sort of uh, moisture barrier or cream or ointment. Uh, we would want to teach our patients about food safety, make sure that food is safe for consumption and prepared and stored the way it should be. Food poisoning and diarrhea um, that frequently accompanies it can be prevented. Uh, so we want to make sure that you're not buying or teaching your patient not to buy food that has damaged packaging. Um, they should uh, take items that require refrigeration home immediately and refrigerate them. If there are leftovers that are not refrigerated within two hours, they should toss them. 
Uh, they want to make sure that the temperature on the refrigerator is between uh, 40 degrees and 32 degrees, and then that the freezer temperature is uh, zero or below. They should wash their hands and surfaces often. Uh, utensils and surfaces, especially like if they're doing things like raw chicken and stuff like that, uh, meat, poultry, you want to separate the cutting boards. You want to wash them thoroughly beforehand. You shouldn't be mixing um, meat, poultry, seafood, eggs, those kind of things. And you shouldn't cut meat on a wooden surface, okay, because it's going to absorb uh, the juices into that surface. You can't really wash it out. Want to make sure they wash all vegetables and fruits thoroughly before they use them. Um, they should not use raw eggs in any form, okay? And when cooking eggs, only use fresh one, fresh eggs that were purchased within the last three to five weeks and kept in a refrigerator. Uh, they should not eat raw seafood, um, and especially if it has a strong or unpleasant odor. You know, sometimes it'll have that ammonia type of odor when it's old. Uh, a good thing is um, for fish, I like to buy my fish with the head on. Uh, that way I can see the eyes. You want to look at those eyes. If those eyes are not clear, uh, you want to stay away from that fish, okay? Uh, use a, a food thermometer or a meat thermometer when you're cooking to make sure that the internal temperature is correct. Uh, with whole meats, it should be at least 145 degrees. Uh, ground meats, 160 degrees, and poultry, 165 degrees. If you're microwaving the food, make sure it's cooked to a temperature of 165 or above. And then you want to keep the hot food at least at 140 degrees or higher once you've cooked it okay and then uh, pasteurized milk and fruit juices only okay especially to small children all right so there are several ways that we can uh, use to promote elimination of the feces enemas uh, suppositories, oral intestinal lavage, and digital removal. The enema is when we take a solution and we introduce it into the large intestine. That is going to help us remove the feces. It can also be used to administer certain medications. Um, it distends the intestine and it's going to irritate the mucosa and that will cause uh, peristalsis. So they're generally classified as either cleansing or retention depending on what we're using them for. They're discouraged for use with anybody who is myelosuppressed or anybody who has mucositis because it can cause uh, bleeding, anal fissures, or abscesses, and these can lead to infections. It should also be avoided in anybody with a bowel obstruction or a paralytic ileus because it increases the risk of perforation. Cleansing enemas help remove feces from the colon. They're often used for constipation or fecal impaction. They prevent involuntary escape of that fecal matter during a surgical procedure. And they help uh, us to visualize the intestinal tract, and they help promote uh, regular bowel function during a bowel training program. There are several different types. Hypotonic is one with tap water. Isotonic uses normal saline. So depending on the use and what the risk factors are for the patient on what we're going to use and why we're using it. Retention enemas, uh, those are to be retained in the bowel for a prolonged period of time. Oil retention enemas, these help lubricate the stool. Uh, karma na native enemas, these help expel flatus from the rectum and provide release from gas. Medicated enemas, they can provide medications that are absorbed through the mucosa, and then anthelminic enemas, these destroy things like, you know, intestinal parasites like pinworms and things along that nature. So your book will talk to you about how to properly administer these enemas, and it's definitely something that you want to know so that you're giving them to the patient right. Suppositories, these are a solid shaped uh, um, device that we will insert into the um, body cavity, and it's designed to melt at a certain body temperature. 
various rectal suppositories are available. Okay, they do make them for children and for infants, but you just want to make sure that you check with your physician, you know, or the pediatrician before you administer anything, even with um, adults. You know, you want to make sure that you're following the correct guidelines. All right, suppositories can help stimulate the bowel in a constipated patient. There are something called retention suppositories, and these deliver drug therapy. Uh, they can deliver medication. So like when our patient is vomiting and we can't give them um, an antipyretic, we could give it to them rectally. Also, uh, compazine, that's used for patients that have nausea and vomiting. And, you know, obviously if they have current nausea, you don't want to give them something if they're just going to throw it up. So you can give them this safely. Okay, but you're not going to use a suppository for someone that has diarrhea because what's going to happen? They're just going to get rid of it. All right, other things you can consider are oral intestinal lavage. Uh, this is something like Go Lightly um, that we use when we're prepping someone for a bowel prep. Uh, we're getting ready to do a colonoscopy on them, and we need to empty the bowel. So we're going to give them this uh, oral intestinal lavage or this Go Lightly, okay, and uh, they can uh, eliminate the feces in the bowel so that we can safely go in there and view the structures. Uh, digital removal, um, this is something that we do when there's fecal impaction caused by constipation and the normal passage of stool is not happening. Uh, we have small amounts of fluid that might be leaking past the impacted mass, okay? And um, this happens sometimes to patients who use a lot of laxatives or they're not mobile, okay? Or they have some sort of uh, spinal cord injury, uh, diabetes, Parkinson's. Um, some sort of kidney disease. These patients are all at high risk, okay? And um, we have to include things like adequate fluids, adjustment of medication before we consider doing this uh, digital removal. So, you know, in other words, we're doing everything that we can do possibly first. We're increasing that fiber. Um, we're making sure um, that they can't expel it voluntarily. Uh, we may have even used things like oil or cleansing enemas, and maybe they can't either um, work or break up the mass. So we have to go in there and remove it manually. Uh, to do this, an order is required from the physician, and it's not a very comfortable feeling for the patient. It could cause a lot of discomfort as well as irritation of the uh, rectal mucosa. So, you know, we want to be cautious when we're doing it. And um, also, it could stimulate uh, the vagus nerve response and a slow heart rate. If that happens, you need to stop the procedure immediately, monitor the patient's heart rate and blood pressure, and then notify the physician. Sometimes patients can use a sitz bath or a tub bath, and uh, that can help soothe the irritated, irritated area, um, status post the uh, removal. All right, and the um, healthcare provider may also order. Uh, an oral retention enema to be given before the procedure to try to help soften the stool a little bit. Uh, we talked a little bit about the types of uh, enema, the cleansing versus the uh, retention, the oil, the carminative, the medicated and the anti um, also sm large volume versus small volume. Uh, I'll go back over those briefly. So for the cleansing enemas, uh, we're using those to remove feces, usually for constipation, fecal impaction. Uh, if there's in, um, a surgical procedure scheduled and we just want to remove the feces so that the patient doesn't have a bowel movement during the procedure uh, to promote uh, visualization of the intestinal tract. So again, um, we might want to look at um, the intestinal tract through colonoscopy or radiography. Um, also to establish regular bowel functioning if we're doing a bowel training program with the person. And the types of solutions used for that are tap water, normal saline solution, soap solution, and hypertonic solutions. And then for the uh, retention enemas, we talked about the um, oil retention enemas. These lubricate the stool and the mucosa to help the person move the bowel or the stool e easier. And um, it's about 150 to 200 mLs of the solution is given. The carminative enemas, these help get rid of flatus, okay, and uh, give release from gas. So common solutions include milk and molasses enema, uh, mag sulfate, glycerin water. 
and uh, medicated enemas. These uh, provide medications that can be absorbed through the rectum. And then uh, anthelmic enemas, these destroy those intestinal parasites. So solutions can be um, large volume or small volume. Uh, they could be anywhere from um, 120 or even 70 mLs um, up to 1,000 okay, mLs that were given to the patient. So it depends on you know, what we're doing with the patient and uh, what we're trying to um, administer and how we're doing it. So if we're doing a cleansing enema, we would use a large volume of solution. But if we were given a hypertonic solution, then we would use a small volume. So that's what you really need to know about those uh, solutions. What type am I giving and how would I typically get it? Remember, hypertonic is going to draw something out. So uh, you may not need as much of it. Which enema would be used for a patient with intestinal parasites? And your choices are oil retention, karma native, uh, nutri nu nutritive, or ant helmic. And um, if you said ant helmic, then you would be correct. All right, that's going to be used to destroy intestinal parasites. The oil retention lubricates the stool. Uh, the karma native helps expel the flatus, remember. And the uh, nutritive administers fluids and nutrition rectally. Uh, those oil retention enemas, those are going to help us lubricate the stool and the intestinal mucosa for easy defecation. The karma native, remember, helps expel flatus. Uh, medicated provides medications through the rectum. And the anti-helmic destroys intestinal parasites. Uh, for bowel training programs, we want to uh, manipulate factors that the patient um, can control. Okay, so fluid and food and, and food intake, exercise, and time for defecation. Um, eliminating um, a soft form stool at regular intervals without laxatives. So these are things that we want them to achieve. Okay, and if we can get them to achieve them over time, then we'll have success. Uh, so we're ma manipulating the things that they can control um, without using something invasive first. NG tubes, uh, sometimes we have to put these in to decompress or drain the stomach of fluid and unwanted contents. Uh, they help um, allow the GI tract to rest before or after abdominal surgery. They promote healing, and they're often uh, inserted to monitor GI bleeding. These can be a single or a double lumen. Okay, um, we put them into the stomach. Uh, we can put medications in through them. Okay, or they can be used to decompress. Um, and you know, you can put feedings in them, right? Um, sometimes we can remove things like poisons or medication or air that's in the abdominal area that we don't want. Okay, um, sometimes the patient has other issues going on, like a paralytic ileus or an intestinal obstruction. So we can use the NG tube to help rest uh, that tract, and we can also use it before or after abdominal surgery. Uh, that NG tube is going to be put in through the nasal pharynx into the stomach, okay? And then if it's used for decompression, it's usually going to be attached to suctioning. So remember, when you're listening to those um, sounds, you want to disconnect the suctioning so you can actually hear the actual uh, sounds of the GI tract and not those of the suctioning, okay? Um, and it'll stay in until the underlying condition is resolved. Uh, there's something called a Levine tube. That is a single tube. It lacks a venting system, and you have to be careful with it. Um, mucosa damage can occur if the suction is applied continuously. So suction is usually applied intermittently. And then uh, there's a Salem sump NG tube. Uh, that's a double lumen tube. So one empties into the stomach, and the other one uh, provides a continuous flow of air. Uh, the airflow lumen controls the suction by preventing the drainage lumen from pulling the stomach mucosa into the tube opening and irritating the lining.
Uh, NG tubes used for decompression require irrigation with 30 to 60 mLs of nor normal saline every four to six hours to maintain patency. So make sure you read up a little bit on that. All right, so uh, to promote safety, when you put a solution into the NG tube, you have to verify placement before you put anything in a tube, whether it's a fluid or a medication. All right, so um, you want to make sure that you know how to do that. And we usually mark the tubes with some sort of marking after um, the tubes have been placed and they've uh, looked at it with x-ray and verified the placement. We can mark that tube and measure it from where it exits the stomach um, to where the tube ends and document that. We can also look for things like um, aspirate pH, um, residual, okay? Um, things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea to see if the patient's tolerating the tube. We don't use air into the tube. It's not reliable and it can cause um, improper placement of the tube. So we no longer auscultate for tube placement. Uh, ostomies, what types? Okay, so uh, sometimes patients have to have surgery to create an opening for the elimination of the feces. This is called an ostomy, okay, and um, it goes from the um, inside of the organ to the outside of the abdominal wall, and then a stoma is placed there, okay, and um, then uh, it sutures the mucosa to the skin and it forms a way to eliminate that bowel. So an ileostomy allows fecal content from the ileum of the small intestine to be eliminated through the stoma. Remember I said it depends on where it's located. A colostomy is going to allow form feces in the colon to exit through the stoma. Uh, this is through the opening of the ostomy and colostomies are further classified by the part of the colon which, from which they originate. Okay, so um, again, when you're dealing with these type of um, of patients, um, it's always good if you have a, a wound or an ostomy nurse involved, okay? A wound ostomy continence nurse is what they're actually called, and uh, they can also help um, with patient teaching, determining where the stoma should be, and things like that. The ileostomy or the colostomy could be permanent or temporary. All right, and um, they might be temporary just to allow time for the intestines to heal after some sort of surgery or injury. All right, the um, intervention um, that does not involve an external stoma is the restorative uh, proctocolectomy ileo pouch. Okay, it includes a J pouch or an internal pouch, and this is used for patients that have things like inflammatory bowel disease or ulcerative colitis. Uh, it involves removal of the colon and the rectum, but it leaves the anus intact. So the patient with the ostomy is going to need physical and psychological support, okay? Um, they're sure going to have some self-esteem issues, most likely. Uh, they need to know how to care for that ostomy and um, other things about it. So you want to teach them about the ostomy care itself, about how they can keep um, free of odors, okay? Because they're not going to want those odors. That's going to cause embarrassment and uh, problems with them and their lifestyle. Uh, things you would um, want to teach them is um, how they can keep it odor free, uh, how to inspect it regularly, and what colors they should look for. Remember that um, it should be dark pink to red. Dark or blue indicates uh, compromised circulation. Uh, bleeding around the stoma should be minimal, and you want to notify the physician or have them notify the physician if there's any color change. All right, also the size of the stoma. So in the beginning, it's going to be a little bit swollen, uh, but that should go down. And after that, if you do see edema, um, then they would want to notify the physician because there's most likely going to be some sort of problem. Okay, the area around the skin, um, around the site, the skin around that site needs to be kept clean and dry. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, irritation and breakdown, and you want to make sure that the appliance that they're applying there is not leaky. Also, you want to monitor their um, intake and output as far as fluid.
uh, especially for the first three days, okay, every four hours you would be monitoring that. And then um, you're teaching the patient, you know, acceptance of it, how to care for it, encourage them to look at it, okay? And um, so you think about that mental and that psychological aspect and them accepting the fact that they have it and what they have to do in order to care for it properly. Uh, also, you're going to teach them, you know, how to take care of that uh, device and how to um, change it. Okay, depending on uh, what type of um, diversion that they have, what type of device that they're going to be using uh, to collect the stool, uh, how long it's safe to leave it on the skin, how often they have to change it, and uh, procedures that they can use in order to change it. So again, uh, the location of the um, colostomy is going to make a difference on um, how that stool is going to come out. You know, is it higher? Is it lower? This is your transverse colostomy. And then D for the uh, ascending colostomy. And then uh, ileostomy. All right, so um, the things we just talked about, keeping the patient odor-free, um, inspecting the stoma regularly, noted, noting the size, keeping the site clean and dry, making sure the fluid intake and ad output is adequate, uh, explaining the aspects of care to the patient and self-care, and then encouraging the patient to look at and care uh, for the ostomy so they, they can accept those changes in the body. So you're comparing uh, the different stomas. If the stoma is pale, it could indicate some sort of anemia. Um, if it's eroded around the area, it could be um, a flush stoma, okay? Um, it could cause a flush stoma, and that could be a problem, okay? And then, um, you know, you want it to be that beefy red or that pink, all right? So we already talked about if it's blue or dusky, um, it can cause – it can be a, a sign of a circulation issue. If it's black or dark looking, it could be a sign of necrosis, Okay, so what's going on with it and, um, you know, teach the patient what they need to look at and what they need to know. Um, explain the reason why the patient had to have um, the bowel diversion and they should understand it and be able to um, do a return demonstration to you understanding why they had to have it um, and what the problems are. Um, explain to them um, about uh, self-care behaviors that they should engage in and they should be able to return, do a return demonstration on that. Um, describe follow-up care and support resources that they're going to need. They should be able to um, explain that back to you also. They should be able to tell you uh, where they need to go to get their supplies, and they should be able to verbalize any fears or concerns, and they should also be able to demonstrate a positive body image. So by them showing you that they're ready to engage in that colostomy care, you know, that's going to help you know that they're um, demonstrating that, that they've accepted it. And you can teach them things like how to empty the bag before they go out on dates, um, how to eat, you know, at certain times in the, of the day, and um, how to control odors and stuff like that so people won't be aware of everything that's going on with them.